And we are back here in WrestleRant, folks. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, where I break down all the pay-per-views that I watch on the WWE Network. Today, we're talking about Bad Blood 2003 as seen on the network. So my first time watching the show just recently, not a bad show overall, but not a great show at that. There were parts of it I enjoyed, some parts of it that were just kind of worthless. Um, I might as well just mention this now. It's not a match, and I look at the match results on Wikipedia to kind of refresh my memory as to what happened. I don't take notes or anything. I just kind of remember what happened during the match and just kind of look back at the results on Wikipedia. Of course, it doesn't resi- it doesn't list the, the segments and stuff like that, so I might as well just mention this now before I forget. The uh, redneck triathlon between Stone Cold Steve Austin and Eric Bischoff, who had a very entertaining run as co-GMs of Raw throughout 2003. This was not one of their brightest moments. Um, Parts of it were funny. It just ultimately felt like a total waste of time. They had a burping contest backstage. They had a pie-eating contest. And not pie-pie, but pie. You know, the rocks kind of pie. In the ring with Mae Young, and that was gross. And Austin forfeited, leading to the main event, which was... Supposed to be a singing contest, but Bischoff got thrown in a hog pen. I lost. I lost. I, they lost me. I, I forgot what happened. I have no idea. But I think I'm pretty sure Austin won. It just felt like a total waste of time. Again, the crowd ate it up. They were in Texas. So, of course, they love to see their hometown hero, Stone Cold Steve Austin. And I love Austin, too. And the chemistry he had, that dynamic with Bischoff was great. But, you know, I can't complain about the McMahons being all over Raw and pay-per-views and SmackDown and shit like that nowadays. And then not complain about this. I know, like, you can make the case, like, oh, but Bischoff and Austin were entertaining, and now the McMahons aren't, but, again, I could see that, but I'd be hypocritical, I'd have double, I'd have double standards if I said that it's okay for these guys to do it, to overshadow everything else in the show, and kind of be overexposed, and take up a bunch of TV time, yet it's not okay for Shane and Stephanie and Vince to do it, you know what I mean? It really makes no sense, so I felt the same way watching this, I mean, again, parts of it were funny, but ultimately... It felt like a total waste of time, like a total waste of pay-per-view time. Something, why not just do it on Raw? I don't think you needed to waste as much time as you did on uh, at Bad Blood with it. As you know, as much time as they did, as as much time as they devoted to this stuff, they could have put towards the other matches on the show. Which no match other than the last two matches, last three matches rather, went more than ten minutes. So come on, really. Anyway, in terms of the in-ring action on this show, kicking off with tag team action, Roddy Mack and Christopher Nowinski taking on the Dudley Boys and scoring the victory. Um, the match was what it was, a very basic match, nothing really notable about it whatsoever, just kind of throwaway, basic raw match at best. Um, the whole storyline they were going for was that Mack and Nowinski and Teddy Long, who was managing those guys at that time, uh, Mack and Nowinski, he confronted Devon before the match backstage on like Raw or before the show. I don't remember what it was, but he was saying, why do you take why do you take orders from a white man when he tells you to get the tables? Why do you listen to him? That's racism, you know, whatever. So Butler tells him to get the tables during this match. Devon hesitates, which allowed the heels to score the victory. And that never really led anywhere. It's not like the Dudley boys split up. Um, I'm pretty sure they went heel after this and they went over to SmackDown. So, what was really the point? You know what I mean? It's not like it led to a split, so the match wasn't good. And then in the end, whatever angle they were going for and teasing a you know teasing tension between the Dudley boys, it led nowhere because they went to SmackDown and they were, you know, I think they got buried alive or something, right? By The Undertaker. Not buried alive, but they were off TV for the most part after the Great American Bash. So, this was really just kind of a waste of time. I don't know why it opened the show to begin with. It felt more like a filler match in between two bigger matches. So after that, we had Tess versus Scott Steiner, where the win- winner would uh, win the services of Stacy Keebler, the managerial services of one Stacy Keebler. The match sucked. Um, these guys never had good chemistry. The feud was all right, but the matches weren't good. Scott Steiner at this point wasn't really capable of having a good match, and Test, I don't know, he could have good matches, but not not at this point in time. Not in 0203 anyway. I don't know why. I like Test. Like he had a really really good match with Shane for what it was at. SummerSlam 99, but that was four years earlier. And like in 06 when he came back, the matches of his sucked too. I don't know. I just never really bought into him as like a big deal and couldn't have really seen him as world champion. People ask me that all the time. Could Test have been a bigger be- uh, could have been a bigger deal in WWE? Maybe, but just as far as what I've seen from him in terms of in-ring ability, he wasn't that good to warrant a world title push. But that's just me. So the match wasn't really that good. Steiner won. Test... His uh, chair shot backfired, hit him in the head. Scott Steiner picks up the win in the ma- managerial services of Stacy Keebler. And I think that backfired too. Speaking of backfiring, um, I'm pretty sure Steiner, Steiner turned heel and he started treating Stacy like shit for the rest of the year. So that really led nowhere too. Um, but not that good of a match whatsoever. 
I mean, they 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 were twelfth in their limits and what they were capable of, but they just never really had great chemistry as in ring opponents. Um, after that, for the Intercontinental Championship, Booker T contending for the gold against Christian. Again, a decent match, but it never really got out of the next out of the first gear before it abruptly ended. Christian attempted to walk out with the title. The referee said, "If you walk out, you'll have to forfeit the championship." And it's like. Really? Like, the referee can make that decision? I thought it had to be one of the GMs. I've never seen that before, so that was a bit strange. So before he can get counted out, Christian gets back in the ring before getting himself DQ'd, and he retains the title anyway. I was waiting for, like, the referee to say, oh, you can't retain your title that way, but he did anyway. So the match just kind of ended like that. Booker T won via DQ. Christian retains the title. That was a bit underwhelming, so I'm not really sure what the point of that was supposed to be. So that was a disappointing match. Uh, for the World Tag Team titles up next, La Resistance winning the gold from Rob Van Dam and Kane. Throwaway match. Um, the match only went five minutes. Felt like it was over before it even began. Um, obviously, the big story they were trying to tell here was teasing tension between RVD and Kane, building towards building towards Kane's heel turn later on that month in June, and also their match at SummerSlam that year as well. So, uh, was it SummerSlam? I'm pretty sure it was SummerSlam. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Kane and RVD had a match at SummerSlam, not like before that, but anyway... Uh, yeah, the match was basically throwaway. New World Tag Team Champions crowned. After that, Goldberg taking on Chris Jericho and easily the best match of the night up to this point. And in my opinion, one of Goldberg's better WWE matches. In the year that he was there, he did not have many great matches, but I thought Jericho got a pretty good match out of him. And I like the story. I like the feud that they were having. I don't really remember the feud too well, but the video package said that Jericho cut a promo and he was talking about how um, during their days in WCW, they used to be good friends. Don't really remember that. But Jericho did say that once Goldberg started to win and win and win and win some more, his ego started to grow too. So he became too big for Jericho. Jericho said he couldn't become a bigger star in WCW, so he left and became a big star in WWE. It's kind of along the same lines of why he left. I mean, Jericho talked about it in his DVD documentary, in his book, blah, blah, blah. Kind of a, you know, a tired story at this point. But Jericho's talked about it before and how You know, he did feud with Goldberg in WCW all those years ago, many years earlier, and the feud was just kind of cut short because Goldberg didn't really want to have a real competitive match with Jericho, despite how much momentum the feud had and people wanted to see Jericho get his ass kicked, which was the whole point all along, and Jericho understood that. He didn't want to get squashed by Goldberg in just a minute or two, like every other jabroni on the WCW roster. That made no sense to him. It made no business sense to just about anyone with a pair of eyes or with common sense. So, they had him squash Jericho in a minute or two. Jericho got pissed. He kind of felt like WCW wasn't really the place for him anymore, and he left for WWE. So, kind of along the same lines, and not word for word, but kind of what happened, I guess, to a degree. So, I like they kind of added that sense of realism to the matchup. Um, like I said, the match went about 10 minutes. Good match. Jericho went over, or rather, Goldberg. Yeah, God forbid, Jericho went over. Goldberg went over in the end. Um, not a great match, but like I said, a pretty good match for a Goldberg match, especially in WWE that he didn't really seem motivated at all. Just kind of there for the money. Love Goldberg, but his WWE run was kind of a bust, uh, you know, all things considered. But anyway, after that, we had Ric Flair taking on Shawn Michaels. I never knew this match happened before WrestleMania 24. I guess it did. I guess I should have known better, but a good match. Again, kind of disappointing. We had some interference from Randy Orton, so they got the focus on him, which was good. Um, he got a bit of a rub from helping Ric Flair win. But um, not the epic match I thought it was going to be. Maybe I set my bar too high after watching the WrestleMania 24 match multiple times. So maybe that was my own undoing. But uh, it was still a pretty good match. Entertaining. Definitely better than a lot of the other matches on the undercard. So I enjoyed it. Ric Flair going over in the end. It was a logical feud to do. Shawn Michaels was coming off his feud with Triple H. You know, in the springtime, he would go on a feud with Triple H again the following year. in Bad Blood 04 in that Hell in a Cell match, which I'll talk about in my next video. Uh, but still, a, a good match and a good win for Ric Flair. And I like the story they were telling with Ric Flair, you know, uh, rising up against Triple H and Shawn Michaels. You know, he earned Shawn Michaels' respect in that respect. Um, not to repeat myself, but he earned Shawn Michaels' respect in that sense. And then in the end, Ric Flair turned on Shawn. It was all a ruse the entire time. Had a match in the show, and Ric Flair won. So a good story told and, and a good match. Not a great match. Not as not as great of a match as I thought, as I thought it was going to be, but still pretty good. And then we get to the main event, the Hell in a Cell match for the World Heavyweight Championship with Mick Foley serving as the special guest referee, Triple H defending against Kevin Nash. So, in comparison to past Hell in a Cell matches, this was not good. But, considering who was involved, the very boring during his reign of terror, Triple H, 
taking on an even worse wrestler in Kevin Nash. Triple H was not a bad wrestler. He is not a bad wrestler. But if he's in there with an equally boring wrestler, his matches are boring. So boring plus boring does not equal exciting people. It equals boring. Um, Triple H during this period of time did not have many exciting matches from 02 to 05. Um, up until he lost the belt to Batista one last time at WrestleMania. I mean, the matches with Sean were great. I enjoyed those. But beyond that, didn't have many great opponents. Um, so anyway, Kevin Nash was really in no position to be having a main event match on pay-per-view inside Hell in a Cell. But considering, you know, the limitations, like I said earlier with Steiner and Test, it was a decent match. I don't even want to say good, but they exceeded my expectations ever so slightly. I've seen the match multiple times before. It's on the Hell in a Cell competition DVD, which I talked about before. So I've seen the match like a million times, but I watched it again. Um, it's all right. And I, I'm, I'm trying to think like up to this point, pretty much every Cell match, other than the big boss man match at WrestleMania 14 or 15, I'm pretty sure it was 15, was, uh, was great. Every Hell in a Cell match leading up to this was pretty damn good. So then you have a match like this that's not really as good. And at least they had Mick Foley as the referee, kind of adding that extra element to it and playing off what happened the last time Triple H stepped inside Hell in a Cell, the previous Hell in a Cell match. Jericho and Triple H, referee Tim White, legitimately had his career ended by being smashed into the side of the cage, which Ric Flair, or rather Mick Foley, also did by being bumped into the side of the cage. But the guy's a fucking madman, so you know he had to take the bump, or he was going to take the bump and was willing to do it. Um, but still, he served you know, his role in the match very well. No interference from any Evolution guys. Ric Flair called it down the middle. Or, keep on saying Ric Flair. Uh, Mick Foley kept on calling it down the middle. In a, in a decent match, like I said, not as bad as you would think it would be considering who was involved in the circumstances and blah, 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 but it didn't drag on forever, got 20 minutes, could have lasted a little shorter, but, you know, for what it was, it was a main event match, every other match in the show did not exceed 15 minutes, so I guess it was only appropriate that this match went 20, and it was hell in the cell, it's not like it was a steel cage or a street fight or something, so it did have to go a little on the lengthier side, but still, for what it was, it was all right, not too bad of a match as you would think it would be, but... Triple H, in the end, still the World Heavyweight Champion. So that is Bad Blood 03. I don't know. I, I liked watching the show just because I liked the Ruthless Aggression era. Um, but just overall, looking back on the results now, it really wasn't that good of a show. The opener was throwaway. Steiner and Test wasn't good. Booker and Christian was underwhelming. The World Tag Team title match was, you know, blinking, you missed it. Goldberg and Jericho was good. Flair and Michaels was pretty good as well. And then Triple H and Nash was Triple H and Nash. So if there's any one match in the show I would recommend watching, it'd probably be, honestly, uh, it has to be a tie between Goldberg and Jericho, obviously, and Flair and Michaels. But if I had to pick one, maybe Goldberg and Jericho, because they did not have many matches after this, if any matches at all. Maybe they faced off on Raw or something. I don't really remember at all. But I feel like if you watch Flair and Michaels, you'll be disappointed thinking of the WrestleMania 24 match and the storytelling and the emotion and drama in that match. And this match really has none of that stuff. To a degree, it does, but not quite to that scale. Nothing's ever really going to top that encounter from WrestleMania 24. Um, but still, it was a good match. So I would recommend Jericho and Goldberg for one of Goldberg's better WWE matches during his year-long stint with the company. So overall, what I, re what I recommend watching the show... If you grew up watching this era, and like I know RJ did, and many others probably as well that are probably listening to this, then yes, like for the nostalgia factor of it, like I watch pay-per-views from 08, 09 all the time, and are they great shows? Not really, but I watch them because I grew up as a fan during that time, and I love that time in wrestling. Just for me watching it, it brings back memories. Um, so I feel like people will have that same connection to this show, but overall though, if you're like me, have never seen this show before, or missed it, or want to check it out to see if it's any good... I would not recommend watching it in its entirety. Um, I enjoyed it for what it was, again, but overall, it didn't really serve much significance. We had one new, you know, uh, I guess one set of championships change hands with the World Tag Team titles, and that was about it. The undercard was pretty forgettable, and only those two, three final matches were, you know, good to great. Um, and not, not even good to great. There were, really wasn't any great matches on this show. Pretty good. Um, from good to pretty good were the final three matches on this event. So again, Bad Blood 03, that is my review of the show. Thank you for watching and listening as always. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And uh, find me on the Twitter machine. Follow me there at WrestleRant on Facebook as well. 
Give the pod channel thumbs up at facebook.com backslash grim.gsm.matthews. And also be sure to stick around um, until my next video, whenever that might be, coming up on either Tuesday or Saturday. I'm taping this so far in advance, I have no idea when this video is going up. But my next video will be covering, I believe, Battleground 2013. I might be mistaken. Don't hold me to it. Don't burn me at the stake if uh, my next video goes up and it's not Battleground 2013, but I'm pretty sure it is. So until then, guys, um, have a great... Actually, I lied. I freaking lied, and I apologize. It's not Battleground 2013. I have no idea what I'm talking about. My next video is going to be covering Bad Blood 04, obviously. Um, I haven't watched it yet. That's the reason why I say Battleground. I have yet to watch Battleground, but I'm going to be going to be watching Bad Blood 04 probably either today or tomorrow. I'm putting up the review, or you know, reviewing it now, and the review won't be up until a couple weeks. I'm reviewing this again so far in advance. I really have no... I have no idea, you know, I, I can't distinguish a headlock from, you know, a uh, wristwatch. A wristwatch from a wrist lock or whatever the hell the, the, the phrase is. I'm going to get out of here, guys. I'm botching all over the place. So have a great one. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch you folks down the road.